Hi everyone. I hope you're having a great week. This has been uh, one of those wonderful North Carolina weeks so far, most of last week. A uh, few little bit of rain, but mostly sunshine and moderate temperatures. And uh, the grass is becoming coming out of dormancy and into uh, its greenness again, which will simply mean it's time to get the lawnmower out again. But that's all right, too. It's part of the cycle of life. It's part of the way God has established uh, this world. Tonight, I want to take a few minutes with you and kind of uh, review where we've been in Corinthians and talk a little bit about division and what to do with a person who simply insists on having their own way. The biggest issue in the church at Corinth was not the man who was sleeping with his father's wife. The biggest issue in the church at Corinth was division. And while that particular sexual sin uh, was exceptionally offensive, and Paul says put that person out so that they uh, can repent and come back, uh, the real issue with the whole church was it's all about me. I don't know if you've ever seen them or not, but there are a series of videos on YouTube that are entitled It's All About Me. And it's about people, and it's done tongue-in-cheek, it's humorous, very funny, most of them. But it's a, a group of people who are doing, you know, they're doing this little recording, and they're saying, you want me to come to your church? Can I get my car washed while I'm inside? And that, that kind of thing. It's all about me. And sadly, that happens too often with people who are committed Christians. We go along for a while, and we're in awe of what God has done. And then we begin to think, too often, we begin to think, well, but what about me? When do I get my way? And so I want to talk about that a little bit this evening in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 6, and we'll look at a lot of other scriptures as well. But in chapter 5, which we've already looked at, Paul says this person who is uh, sleeping with their father's wife, he says, you're celebrating this as though you're so sophisticated that it, everything like this is okay. He says, put that person out. This is not good. He says a little yeast leavens a whole lump. And what he's saying is that when things get out of hand, it won't take long for everything to be moving in that direction. Um, we're familiar with that idea of a slippery slope. Well, this is a case where it's true. So I want to begin at chapter 6, and I want to reread what we looked at last week and go all the way through the end of the chapter, and then attempt to tie all this together. After saying, God will judge those on the outside, expel the wicked man from among you, he continues then to deal with the real, substantive, foundational issue in the church. He says, if any of you has a dispute with one another, Dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Now, trivial cases. I'm sure Paul has a bit of irony in what he's saying here. No one thinks that their complaint is trivial. But in comparison to the big picture, nearly all of our complaints are trivial. And so he says, do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, verse 4 of chapter 6, 1 Corinthians, Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. And he's saying, don't look for the big shot. Get the little guy and ask him to be fair and square about what's going on. He says, I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there's nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, he's going to list some sins after this, but he's addressing the sin also of this divisiveness. 
of wanting my own way and of insisting on it. If I can't have my way, we're going to court. Sure if you could, there, I wasn't sure if you could hear me or not. I had a bad connection there for the moment. He says, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? So do not be deceived. Neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, or male prostitutes, or homosexual offenders, or thieves, or greedy, or drunkards, or slanderers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So Paul says some of you had really pretty nasty lives before you became a Christian. God's taken all that away. The uh, unfortunate thing is, human beings are creatures of habit. And so, we, we can put on a, uh, a new idea, we can begin to practice a new thing, but when push comes to shove, oftentimes we revert to our what we think of as our safe place. We revert to the way we used to do things. You know, we might be kind and gentle and patient most of the time, but if somebody triggers us just the right way, we can explode. So Paul says, you used to have all these issues. God's taken them away. You can't live like that anymore. So he goes on to say, <clears throat> verse 12, and this is a quote from their culture in Corinth, everything is permissible for me, Paul says, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. Again, this is a quote from them. And this comes out of the Greek idea that the body doesn't count for anything. All the, Both these phrases come out of that Greek mentality that says the only thing that's really real is the spirit. The body is just an empty house or a house of clay. And so what you do in your body doesn't matter. It only matters how you think. He says, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. But God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he unites, who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So he's saying that there's a, the body counts. What we do with our body, the way we think about ourselves, the way we uh, exalt ourselves, or the way we underestimate or, or d diminish ourselves, we are tearing down God's temple. God's spirit lives within us. He says, when we are united sexually with someone who is not our legitimate spouse, we become one flesh with them. But he says, when we are united with the Lord, we're united with him in spirit. He's using that comparison, but he's saying we're, all, we're a whole person. God is interested in body, soul, spirit. God is a whole life God for a whole life person. So he says, flee, verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Why? Because you're becoming one flesh with that other individual. Here's the question. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Why? Because that's God's temple. Now, he's going to use this same analogy about the temple in a little while, and he talks about the church being the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's true, too. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But we have a responsibility before God as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, we have a responsibility to keep ourselves unspotted from this world. Now, 
I recognize we're all going to sin and come short of the glory of God. John says in 1 John, anyone who says he has no sin is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But the direction of our life, the normal processes of daily living, should be to remember that God is present inside me all the time. Now, for some of us, for some people, sexual sin is a real temptation. I'm not suggesting that it's not. But so are all the other things that he lists in this, in this section in chapter 6. And he uses the sexual metaphor, I'm convinced, because everybody understands that one. Nobody wants to be cheated on. Nobody wants their partner, their marriage partner, their spouse, to be involved with someone else. And involvement is not just physical. Involvement is spiritual. Involvement is emotional. Evolve, involvement is mental. The people that get into trouble sexually with a person outside of their spouse be, almost always begins with communication. Often it happens in the workplace. And... We're having difficulties at home, so we stop communicating, and we get lonely, and God said it's not good for the person to be alone. And so what happens? We get into a conversation. Oh, this person listens to me. This person understands me. This person thinks what I have to say is important. And we end up with a friendship that moves down the road to an unlawful, immoral relationship. Now, I want us to take that same concept and think about it in terms of uh, what it means to live within the body of Christ. We can begin with good relationships, but at some point, it's just in our humanity that we get a little bit annoyed about something, and then we begin to pout, begin to say, I can't deal with that person, so I'll find another way to deal with all my problems. And the pr way that played out in Corinth is the way it played out, it plays out oftentimes in our culture today. I'll go church shopping. I'll find a church that suits me. Or if I don't get my way, I'm going to stop attending or I'm going to stop giving. People vote with their feet and their wallet. And that is not what God has in mind. Let me turn with you, or turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to begin reading while you're turning there, Ephesians chapter 4. I'll begin reading at verse 11. Oh. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 11. It was Jesus who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, the church is not an institution. The church is a living organism. But in that living organism, there are various parts that God wants all of them to function well and do their part in making the body healthy. And so, the, you know, he uses the analogy often of our physical body. Everything has its place and everything has its job to do. And so he says the reason the church has people in what we might think of as servant leadership roles, is to help everyone work together. They are finding out medically, I was just reading about this this week, that while for years they thought the brain was divided basically into different components, and one section did this part, the, the uh, cognitive thinking, the logic, and one did the automatic reflexes and all that. They're finding out now that nothing in our brain operates independently from all the rest. We are a totally integrated system within the way we, our brain and our spinal column and the nerves, all that stuff. The way it all works is that it is totally integrated and doing multiple tasks at the same time. The brain still is far superior 
to any computer that humans can build. We may not have the same instant memory, but we have all that interconnectedness is what keeps you alive, what keeps you well, what keeps you aware of your situation that you find yourself in. And he says when, when we are willing to allow the people that God has gifted in certain ways to do their job, whether it's evangelist or pastor, teacher, uh, their role is not to be a big shot. Their role is to help. Their role is to help you to become all that God intends for you to be, which means we all have a job to do. Where we find division is where somebody says, my job is to have my way. And that's going to happen, or I'm going to stir up a fuss, and I'm going to get into all this. He continues in Ephesians 4 and says, When this happens, when we attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Now here's the key. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. And from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. What I have found to be true in my experience is that the most contentious people are the ones who have nothing to do and don't want a job. They want to look. They want to judge. They want to be uh, kind of in charge of what somebody else is doing, but they're not really interested in, in being responsible. They like to sit back and say, oh, you should have done it this way. Or, I don't like that. That doesn't suit the way I think about things. But ask them to do something, that's a whole different ballgame. Then there is one excuse on top of another. Now, I realize we live right now in a culture that's very touchy about accountability or criticism or judging. And probably the most misused verse in the whole Bible is Matthew 7, 1, where Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. We love to quote that verse, but we don't look at the rest of the chapter, which is how to do right judgment. Jesus is saying, don't judge in a way that condemns yourself, but rather use right judgment, and here's what that looks like. Now, being held accountable may feel like an attack. If we are not ready to acknowledge how our poor decisions have impacted others. The church is a body. The church has to function together or it falls apart. In John 17, Jesus, there's a whole chapter where Jesus prays for himself and then the disciples and then those of us that would believe based on the testimony of the disciples and the apostles. And what's his prayer about? Unity. Unity is about getting over ourselves in order to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And that is the body of Christ. Now, in Corinth, they fight about everything. In Corinth, they're fighting about sexual freedom. They're fighting about food and drink. They're fighting about who's most important. They're fighting about who baptized who. They're fighting over who's in charge of what, and when they're not getting their own way, guess what they're doing? They say, all right, I'm going to sue you. Does that sound like today's society, too? I think it does in some ways, at least. The point is, God has given us some instructions about what to do with this kind of person. I want to say this about what we just read. Paul says in Ephesians 4, we need to speak the truth in love. Love is not pretending that something is not broken when it's broken. But love is speaking the truth in a way to bring about healing. The surgeon's knife is very different than the soldier's sword. Both cut, but the surgeon's knife is to bring healing. The soldier's sword, it's figuratively speaking, is to bring about defeat. We want to submit ourselves to the surgery that God prescribes for us. And so we, we have to deal with these things. Loving someone is not pretending that everything is okay. And I want to talk about this, speaking the truth in love, 
because it is very difficult sometimes to tell the truth. For example, if someone in the church, like it happened here in Corinth, if someone in the church is involved openly as public knowledge in some sexual sin, it's not difficult to deal with that unless it's in our own family. And so we have to approach a thing with humility and boldness. We have to approach it as not out of pride or anything like that, but out of loving care for the individual. That means we have to be like Jesus in John chapter 8, when he tells the woman, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. He didn't pretend there was no sin. He simply said, let's start over. Here's your opportunity to start your life again in favor with God. And that's what Paul said here. And such were some of you. But we slip back into that mode of uh, self-defense. And it's just not good. So, what does God say about the divisive person? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you turn with your Bible. With me, your Bible. In verse 10, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. And what I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another I follow Paulus, another I follow Cephas, and still another I follow Christ. So Paul says, hey, there's divisions there. This is not what Jesus wants. When he gets back here in chapter 6, he says, this is so bad you're going to court with each other. He says, this is not what we are supposed to do. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, if you have a problem with someone, keeping it on a personal level, you go and talk to them. Don't talk to your neighbor. Don't talk to the preacher. Don't talk to the elders. If you have a problem, swallow your pride, walk across the street or wherever you need to go, and talk to them. And if you can settle it, you're both happy. If not, if they won't listen to you, Jesus says, go back again. And take a couple of people with you. Not that they're on your side, but now you have witnesses that you are attempting to resolve this issue. And if they won't hear them and you together, if they still have this attitude of, get out of my face, then take it to the church and let the church make a decision about how to handle it. That means, excuse me, that means the church not only decides what's right or wrong in this situation, they also make an, a, a statement about how, what to do about it. I have been, I have lived through a number of church splits. I've watched them in some cases uh, as a child. The church where I attended split at one point. I have yet to see a church that actually split over a doctrinal issue. And a split always occurs over who's in charge, who's most important, who has to have their own way. Folks, no matter what congregation we are in, our preacher is imperfect, our elders are imperfect, our deacons, if we have them, are imperfect, but God has given them a role to do and that is to lead and direct so that we can work together. And we are not always going to have our own way. I'll give an example from my own life. Uh, a couple of years ago, pre, pre Florence, how's that for a time? Uh, before 1918 and the hurricane. Uh, the, one year, our preacher, David McCants, came up with an idea and he said, In the fall, let's have a tailgate Sunday. And we'll have our services, and then everybody come back and bring your pickup or whatever you're driving, and bring your grill or whatever, however you want to handle it, and bring enough food for yourselves and somebody else, and let's have a tailgate party on the grounds. And I thought, this is the dumbest thing I ever heard of. Guess what? The parking lot was filled with a lot of people who had never touched our, the ground that we owned. Never come through the door before. 
a tremendous opportunity for outreach, a tremendous opportunity to show commu the community what it means to love one another as Christ loves us. Since then, every year, my question is, are we doing tailgate Sunday? Uh, I could have said, I'm old, I know everything, and I want it my way. We've never done this, we're never going to do it again, and cause a big fuss. It, I'm thankful that I did not for more reason than one, but the primary reason is, that's not my job. Causing a fuss is no one's job. Asking questions, ascertaining what's going on, being sure in your own heart that it's something that you can uh, participate in in a queer conscience, that's all fine. But just to say, I don't like this and we're not going to do it, that is not a Christian attitude. In Romans 16, Paul says this near the end of that chapter. He says, <clears throat> uh, let me see, verse 17, Romans 16, verse 17. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I am full of joy over you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. So Paul says, if there's someone in the congregation who is constantly fussing and stirring up trouble, have nothing to do with them. The only things I can find in my study of Scripture as reasons to disfellowship someone are the overt sexual sin of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and the divisive person as talked about in 1 Corinthians, in Jude, in 3 John, in Titus, in Romans, in 2 Timothy, in Matthew 7. The person who stirs up trouble among brothers is not following Jesus. And they are not about the things of God. They are about the things of themselves. There is a little window sticker or bumper sticker that I've seen recently that I really like. I haven't gotten one yet. But it has capital letters, H-E, and then that angle thing that means greater than, he is greater than I. H-E, greater than I. That has to be our attitude in the church. God is greater than I. God has placed people in roles of responsibility and serving, and he is greater than I. It is not my job, it is not my role, or anyone else's to make their life more difficult. Ask questions, be reassured, understand what's happening, absolutely. But the person who says, my way or the highway, is not producing the fruit of the Spirit in their life. They have reverted to where I am greater than he. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. He is greater than I. It's a very, uh, very interesting way to handle things. Now, we have friends here in Taverna, Don and Lynn Rogers. They're both in their 80s. And Lynn is the well on her way into Alzheimer's or dementia. I don't know the exact disease. She uh, can function in public for a brief period of time. She is developing what they call sundowners, where she's up at night and she doesn't know where she is and she wants to go home. And some of you are more familiar with this than others, I know that. I had this similar thing with my father when he lived with us uh, in the angry stages of dementia. And Don and Lynn soon will be moving, to, of all places, to New Jersey, where their daughter is, and where they can be near her, and he can have help. And if, if Lynn ends up in a dementia unit, in a nursing home, her daughter will, their daughter will be able to see her there. But this I know. <clears throat> in the two years that this has become obvious to the friend, their friends, including Kathy and I, I have never once heard Don complain about 
taking care of land or about his situation. He has said, I never knew how hard it would be. But he doesn't complain. Why? Because he loves her. Is it easy for him? No. But he loves her. And love is the first antidote to anything that's a problem in our life in terms of sin. God so loved you, and God so loved me. And we need to remember that when we are going through all kinds of issues, God's love is constant. When we have to deal in a disciplinary measure with someone who is a member of the body of Christ, we have to do it because we love them, not because they're bad, not because we're angry, not because our ego is on the line. We have to do it because we love them. We are God's instruments here on this earth. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 says that everyone who is a child of God is disciplined by God. And we are his hands and feet and arms and legs. We are his body here on earth. And so that discipline involves, excuse me, I'm still having a little allergy trouble. That discipline involves us being involved significantly in the lives of the members of the church. It's just that simple. And Paul, the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, now every discipline at the time it's applied is never pleasant. But discipline properly applied produces the desired results. And he says, if God isn't disciplining us from time to time, then we're not his child. He doesn't discipline those who are not his child. He disciplines those who are his child. That's the point of that Hebrews 12 passage. Here's what I'm saying. When a person is divisive, when a person is attempting because they want to or because they don't understand it. When a person is attempting to bring harm to the body of Christ, we have to deal with them no matter who they are because we love them. We do not deal with them out of punishment. Punishment is God's business. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We don't do it because we're angry. We don't do it because they're making life hard for me. We discipline them because we love them and we want them to turn again to God. We want them to remain in the body of Christ. I don't know about you, but I found that growing up, that discipline was never pleasant at the time. But it did tend to produce the desired results. I was like the little boy from the story uh, Sunday morning, and if I was acting up during worship and my dad took me out to the back door I was, should have been the one, I didn't know to do this, but I should have been the one that would yell back, pray for me, brothers, because I knew what was coming. Discipline. My father didn't hate me. He didn't punish me. He disciplined me. My mother was the same way. Without discipline, we are illegitimate children. That's what the writer of Hebrews says. And if we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, then discipline, mutual discipline, becomes a part of who we are. Now, when Paul goes on in the rest of this book, he's going to deal with a whole lot of touchy issues. He's going to deal with marriage and divorce and remarriage. He's going to deal with what food is holy and what food is not and what what to do about the idolatry and the uh, bad things that are happening in the land. He's going to deal with them about all kinds of things, about worship, and about spiritual gifts and all of those things. And in a lot of these chapters, Paul is going to say, get it together, folks. Get it together. But he's telling them because he loves them. And I hope that we have an attitude like Jesus, that before we begin a process of discipline, we spend a night in prayer for unity. And we recognize our own place in this process and that we deal with things the way God would want us to. It's a tough subject. It's a hard subject to talk to parents about disciplining their children. Needs to be done. It's a harder subject for us to talk together about church unity and church organization 
and responsibility of the body as a whole. Discipline. But it's absolutely necessary for the body to be healthy. So if you want to think about it in this context, the whole first letter to the church in Corinth, the first one we have, the whole letter is about how to be the best church you can by getting rid of division. By getting rid of the our ego, by getting rid of this uh, self-importance that is so prominent in our, in our heart. And say, let God be God. Let people be responsible for the things they are responsible for. And together, we can be a healthy body. There's some big deals here, some big issues. But God is bigger than those issues. And God can work in the heart of anyone. If he can work in my heart, he can work in the heart of anyone. And so I want us to be thinking about that as we move forward. Next week, we're going to talk about marriage and divorce and remarriage. And this has always been a difficult subject. Been difficult from my understanding. It's been difficult because we have misunderstood or misinterpreted some of what Jesus said. And Paul is going to take it a step further. He's going to say, here's what Jesus said about it, but now here's a new situation, and here's what the Holy Spirit says about this new situation. And we have to understand those distinctions. But the point is this. Leadership, real servant leadership, continually calls us back to the ideal that God presents. Whether it's in marriage, whether it's about settling disputes, whether it's about sexual uh, purity, whether it's about spiritual gifts and how we function within the body, good leadership continues to call us back to here is God's idea. And so what I hope that I've done this evening is said a couple of things. Number one, being divisive is an overt sin against the Holy Spirit. It is a destruction of the body of Christ. Dealing with division is a very difficult thing to do, but it has to be done or it will destroy the body. It's like dealing with cancer. Division never is satisfied. Cancer is never satisfied. It continues to grow until it destroys. And thirdly, before we discipline, we have to examine ourselves. Why am I doing this? Why is this the right thing to do? Is my heart and my mind and my emotions, am I on the right page with God in order to be participating in this process? It's a big, it's a big deal. It's a hard thing to do. That's the truth. But it is a necessary thing to do for the health of the body. I don't know about you. I'm not crazy about medical care. I don't want to be in medical care. I don't like being in medical care. I've had uh, several heart procedures. They are not fun. But the only reason I'm still alive is because I had those heart procedures. And the only reason the church can be alive and be healthy is if we do what it takes to keep it that way. My prayer for every congregation, including Rosemary, is that our leaders will be strong and courageous and filled with love for every person in the congregation. And in because of that, they will be challenged and they will seek the opportunity to speak into our hearts, to speak into our lives, speaking the truth with love so that with discipline we can become all that God intends for us to be, individually functioning at high tech, high speed within the whole body. Thank you for listening tonight. This is a, not an easy subject, but I think it's an important one, and I wanted to put it in at this point. Like I say, next week, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, things are going well for Kathy and I. We've had uh, several great weeks. Sunday at Easter, we had uh, eight adults and one three-year-old here, and we felt like we had adequate numbers to control the three-year-old. So it worked out really well. I hope you had a great Easter. I hope that you are continuing to celebrate the resurrection and the power of resurrection in your own life uh, as you go about this week. Let's pray together as we wrap up tonight. <clears throat> Father God, it is uh, with great joy that we are able to call you our Father. But like children in a human family, as children in your family, we, we sin. 
we sometimes think that we're the most important part of the of your body and we i just ask father that you uh take that attitude out of our heart give us father uh your spirit as it indwells us give us the fruit of that spirit may it be seen in who we are in the way we think in the way we feel in the way we uh, view another person and father may the, that holy spirit that lives within us be the governing guide in all the decisions that we make spiritual physical emotional may your spirit help us to control our ego and put ourselves in the role of the of the servant who imitates your son jesus christ we are so thankful that you have called us we are so thankful that you have taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and put us in the kingdom of your dear son father help us to live in a way that your light will shine through who we are i ask in jesus name amen thank you folks appreciate the comments as they scroll up the screen and i will see you all next week blessings <laughs>